Well, good evening, everyone. I'm Alex Trianis, Dean of the Johns Hopkins Carey Business School. And it's my pleasure to welcome you to our Distinguished Speaker Series, in which we discuss today's most compelling business issues with the most accomplished business professionals. For our first Distinguished Speaker of the new academic year, we're very pleased to have with us Sharon Marcel, Managing Director and Senior Partner of the Boston Consulting Group, Sharon has served also as BCG's North America Chair since 2021. Sharon joined BCG in 1993 and has held many firm leadership positions, including Global Chief, Chief Marketing Officer, Global Chair of BCG's Client Team, and Head of BCG Fed. She has helped transform some of the world's largest private and public sector organizations, including assisting the largest healthcare and consumer product companies on post-merger integrations and restructuring efforts. Prior to joining BCG, uh, Sharon worked for Goldman Sachs and Company in mergers and acquisitions. Sharon, we're delighted to have you here today and thanks so much for making the time to share your insights with our Cary community. Hi, Alex, it's great to be here with you. Thanks so much for having me. So I'll start us off with a few questions, uh, but we're also anxious to hear from our audience as well. And so to the audience members, you can submit your own questions using the Zoom Q&A button at the bottom of your screen at any point. So let's start off by talking a little bit about the business of consulting. Uh, BCG notes that the business model for consulting is very different than other industries. Mm -hmm. And Sharon, so that we can fully appreciate the differences, maybe you could start off by sharing some of the unique aspects of business consulting and why BCG has remained a top performer in this line of business. Yeah, that's a great question, Alex. I think if I think about that, you know, two core reasons um, that I think consulting is both different and that BCG has remained at the top of the game. And, and, and first and foremost is delivering exceptional value to our clients. And in delivering exceptional value, you establish great relationships and the clients ask you to take on tougher and tougher problems over time, and that continues to deepen. And then by word of mouth and, 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 and in other ways, you know, you begin to get introduced to other clients and that exceptional value delivery is, is clearly at the heart of, of success in consulting. But I think the other piece is, is around the people piece because we are consulting, but BCG in particular is supply constrained industry. And what does that mean? It means we have a certain level of demand, but we can only meet that level of demand if we are able to attract and retain the best talent. And, and attracting is one piece of it, and we actually get great people. But if we're not able to retain and motivate people and bring them to the next level, then the consulting model absolutely falters. And so, you know, for me, in the, in the last year that I've been the regional chair, I've really focused hard on the people piece. And um, I'm super proud of what we're doing there. We have 25,000 BCGers around the world. Um, we've grown, you know, in, in a very strong way over 20 years. So, so about 14% um, per year um, over the last 20 years. But Alex, the, the client delivery piece, of course, but then the people piece um, is absolutely key to our success. Well, so in terms of just uh, digging deeper into, into a little bit of the evolution of consulting over time, uh, how have you found that the that the field has changed? And you you refer to this people piece as being essential. Um, is consulting also attracting talent from uh, different fields or backgrounds than in the past? Yeah. So if you look at if you know I've been in the industry for a long time, Alex, and. Um, you know, it's changed a lot. Maybe there's three um, things I, I could note. One is when I first started in consulting, a lot of what we delivered was a slide deck slash document, you know, in terms of recommendations and then maybe a roadmap and you know, maybe a communications plan. And so that was kind of the what we what we delivered. And, and today what we deliver is is fundamentally different. So it's really end-to-end -end solutions, including digital enablement. So it does start still with the strategy piece and what's going on in, in the environment and what does that mean for my industry or segment and what's my strategic way of getting competitive advantage and moving forward. But it goes from that into much more end-to-end -end solutions. So whether it's, it's the right um, technology enablement of the sales force or the digitization of the supply chain, various ways that shows up, but it's one way consulting has changed, changed a lot. I think in a very 
to its credit, you know, consulting um, had more of a generalist model, I would say, you know, 20 or 30 years ago. And today we, we have a lot more expertise. And so we start every project with, um, with fundamental knowledge of, of the industry, of the sub-segment, of the customers, of the suppliers. And I think it allows us to get up to speed a lot faster. And I think that delivers better, better experience for our people, but also better value for our clients. And then I think the third part that's really changed is we have um, a more fluid working model. So again, thinking back, it was kind of on site for four days a week, and then and then you were typically in the office on Friday. And and that has changed a lot over the years and then kind of radically with COVID. And what you find out now is that you know, we're a third on site with clients. They want us to be there and that's where we are. We're a third working together with each other in our offices and we're a third, um, you know, working in a more hybrid model. Um, and so that's all true. But just coming back to, you know, the expertise base and, and some of how we have, um, we've changed, you know, I think diversity in terms of our talent base has been key. And, you know, we've focused on recruiting people with certain functional capabilities, so again, whether that's manufacturing or whether that's medical or supply chain, you know, really thinking about different capabilities. We've doubled down on recruiting talent on in AI. We'll talk about that later, I think, Alex, and also climate and sustainability, which is another one of our big moonshots. Um, so while we continue to get an enormous amount of talent from you know, undergrads and MBA pools, um, we're also tapping into medical schools, PhD programs, you know talent that's coming in from industry um, all around the world. And so it, in, in those ways, consulting really has evolved. Absolutely, well, there's a lot there that we hopefully will dig into um, with some subsequent questions, but um, I, I'd like to, to try to draw a little bit on, on your expertise, all your years in, in consulting and uh, try to get some advice for um, our students and, and others, alums and others on the, on the call that are interested in pursuing a career in consulting. I should just uh, brag on you just for uh, one minute, uh, which I didn't say in my intro, that you've been recognized by Consulting Magazine as one of the top 25 most influential consultants and one of the five women leaders in consulting. So how, um, how does one become um, as successful as you've become? What, what really, um, what advice would you have for setting yourself apart in the industry? Yeah. Um... It's interesting. When I interviewed um, at BCG, Alex, I loved the interviewing process. I thought it, I thought it was so fun. And so people ask, why did you stay? Why have you stayed at BCG? And I think there's two fundamental reasons. The first and second is the people, and the first and second is the clients. I've loved the people I've gotten to work with over time, and it's been a privilege, you know, to, to work with the people I have. They've they've created such um, richness for me in in my career and so that's kind of why i've stayed you know i think in consulting one of the things you have an opportunity to do which can be different from other jobs is you can really embrace an entrepreneur entrepreneurial mindset so i was the first head of women at bcg in north america that was something new that we were doing in north america that was fun i started that up there are many client situations where we BCG had never worked with that client. And I got to go into that client setup and form new relationships and establish BCG and the client. You mentioned BCG Fed, Alex. That was a part of the business that we it was very nascent for us. And I had the opportunity to go in and really, you know, help to establish our work with the federal government of the United States. So all of these entrepreneurial opportunities in consulting are so exciting. And so I would say enter enter consulting with an entrepreneurial mindset and think about the client work and the people and all of that, but then also what can you do new to contribute to the firm? I think the second is um, if you choose consulting or if you don't, but if you're interested in consulting, find your passion. So your passion may be consumer goods companies. It was my passion for many, many years. And then it became you know, the federal workforce and federal government. Some people's passion is around AI. Some is around climate. Some is around enabling our supply chains to be more resilient. And in a post-COVID world, I mean, it was never more exposed than during COVID in terms of supply chain resiliency. But whatever your passion is, you can pursue that at BCG and in consulting. So I would encourage you to do that. And then if I think back to my younger self, Alex, what advice I would give my younger self? You know, my, my I have two girls, 24 and 22. And um, 
you know, sometimes they would say to me, mom, you know, mom, do you make mistakes? And I would say, yeah, every day, every day I make mistakes. And the truth is, you know, whether you're a very senior person or you're brand new in your job, and it was certainly true for me all along the way, you're going to make mistakes and, and things won't be perfect. And, you know, just accepting the gift of imperfection, doing your best, learning from it, and just being kind to yourself, you know, in terms of your development would be my third piece of advice. That's awesome. Well, it's very consistent with a couple of our values at the Care Business School. One is boundless curiosity. So uh, constantly looking uh, to learn and, and pursuing that, that passion that you talked about and then relentless advancement and being you know, resilient when you do make those mistakes that, of course, we, we all do, do make. Um, well, it, it's certainly a fascinating uh, profession. You've had incredible opportunities um, to, uh, to, to learn and to help shape uh, companies and other organizations. But um, if we were to look a little bit at the uh, sort of the negative um, column, um, the, the liability column, if you like, that, that uh, consultants also always have a bit of a, um, a reputation of, of you know, traveling all the time, working really long hours, tight deadlines, frequent change. And, and that may not appeal to everyone. So I guess what questions should prospective consultants be asking themselves to know if this career path is, is really right for them? And, and you know, how do you um, and, and your colleagues deal with these challenges of balancing your, your personal life uh, with a career in consulting? Sure, let me, let me take each in order. First, um, change um, and, and how much you like change and, and whether new topics and, and new subjects and new challenges are stressful or interesting, that would be one, one lens I would use to figure out whether consulting you know, might be right for you. So for me, the change is like the best part of the job. That's the part that's, you know, that doing new things, learning new things, you know, you know moving actually across industry, moving across clients, you know, that has all you meeting new people within BCG, whether it's people who are on my marketing team or the people who I work with in India, that to me, that kind of change has kept me fresh. And, 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 and so it is, it's a challenge with consulting, but I think it's also one of the great benefits of consulting is the amount of, of exposure you get and the amount of, of change that you have. And, and, you know, look, the, look, the hours can be long, um, you know, the amount that you can kind of manage those has both changed over time because I think we're a lot more uh, disciplined and we're not a lot more open in, in terms of you know flexibility around hours. Um, but the hours can still be long. Um, and and I you know I've, I've adopted something you know during the women's initiative where I used to talk a lot to our women and women outside of BCG around this notion of work life balance. And and to me it's really work life blend. You know, because you never get it right, you know, work-life balance, it's never perfect on the scales. You know, that again gets at this notion of perfection. So for me, it's around blending, blending your work, blending your life, making sure that for you, it's making you happy. You know, are, are you putting in the right amount? Are you taking out the right amount? Do you have enough time to spend with your with your friends, with your family, with, with the people that are important with your life, pursuing your hobbies? And I think in consulting, you can have that. Um, you can have a, a overtime work-life blend that actually um, that actually is, is quite fulfilling and quite motivating. And Alex, maybe I'll come a little bit back to that. I know we're going to talk a little bit more um, about some of these topics, and I'll, I'll come back to some statistics there. Super. Um, that, that would be... Um... Great, and you know we, when we're talking about sort of long hours and and, and lots of deadlines and so on, um, we certainly try to to, to train uh, folks in business school to be able to to handle that. Um, and uh, you know I, I think that's a, a your point about change is um, is a critical one that people who really love um, to to constantly be exposed to new things will will love consulting. Um, you know you you've obviously worked um, with colleagues uh, from a variety of different uh, top business schools. And so I'm, I'm sure you've reflected on, you know, what, what is the right preparation to receive in, in business school in order to lead to the greatest success at a place like BCG. So I'm curious if you might um, enlighten us on some of the things as, as uh, business school leaders as well that, um, that we might be doing more of in, in business schools or things that you think really have an impact in, in terms of readiness and success in consulting. 
Well, I think I think business school is a great um, foundation for consulting because in consulting, to be successful, you have to be able to work in teams. Alex, I know you guys spend a lot of time working in teams. You have to be a good listener. You have to be able to take feedback. Um, you have to be be able to iterate and and incorporate that feedback and get better. And so, you know, I I think that and 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 then there's a, a piece around leadership. And I know you've really leaned in to that as well. And so I think um, I think business school is a great training to be a consultant. And um, it was a great opportunity. I mean, I worked on different things in business school, Alex, and you probably worked on in business school because we probably had different things that we needed to to round out. So for me, it was more the leadership piece and the speaking piece. And, and that part I worked on versus the analytics coming from Goldman Sachs. You know, I had a pretty solid foundation of analytics. Other people may have had more exposure on the speaking and, and leadership side, maybe less on the analytics. So it it's also, you know, the nice thing about business school is you, you can go on your own personal journey and round out the things um, that are important to you. But I think it's it's a great foundation for for consulting. Great. Well, I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna switch topics a little bit here um, because I'd I'd love to hear about uh, BCG's AI based trust index. It's a fascinating uh, new project that I know you've been um, working on. And um, so why don't we start uh, breaking this down a little bit? I think, I think it's important to lay the, the framework of you know, why trust is so important in organizations and how you think about that in terms of, of stakeholders in general. And then we'll get into uh, the actual uh, trust index. Yeah, so I think trust you know, between consumers and businesses and employees and employers has never been you know, more important than it is now. And in fact, in, in many surveys, and I'm sure you've seen them, um, people have, have said they trust business more than they do our governmental and political leaders. You know? And so in fact, business is being asked to do much, much more around um, trust and integrity and leading with integrity. And you know, I think that's great. I think we're very much up, up for the task of doing that. Um, but trust, you know, much like culture, has been little squishy. So how do you how do you measure culture or how do you measure trust? I think you can measure culture too. We can come back to that in another in another session. But you can measure trust. And and you know it's it's pretty interesting because I think it is it's a leading indicator of of company performance. Not a flag, but a leading indicator. So if you can actually see the most trusted companies, those will be the companies that actually will rise in terms of shareholder valuation. So how do you measure that? We have an AI-based trust tool and index that helps us look at longitudinal data scraped um, from the internet, um, from job sites, from, um, you know, from traditional media sources that actually, and it helps to weight that scraping to actually measure trust on an absolute basis, but then also relative to peers. And I think that is, is um, fascinating to CEOs and other corporate leaders because trust in a vacuum is, is, is what it is. But if you're a retailer and you can look at directly comparable re retailers and you could talk, talk about trust and then you can talk about the drivers of that trust, okay? And the driver might be something around in stock. The driver might be around something around, I take the product home and the product isn't a good product. The, the trust may be around pricing. But you can get into what what and trust influences you know consumer behavior. Of course, if you if you trust a brand, you know you're more likely to become a loyalist to that brand, and you're and you're more likely to to shop it more. And so that's just one example. But across any whether it's the energy industry, the retail industry, consumer products industry, healthcare industries, et cetera, et cetera. You know this notion of trust and. Um, and being able to, to understand what some of the rotors of trust would be in your industry is really, really valuable. And, and in fact, you, you've, got, you've identified four dimensions of, of uh, trust, which I think are, are very interesting to, uh, to parse out. So one is uh, perhaps something that, that some may view as more traditional competence, uh, yep. whether the company can really effectively accomplish um, the, the tasks at hand for the stakeholders. But then you also have the other three dimensions of fairness, transparency, and resilience, which I, I, I think uh, we, we would agree that 
all three of those have really come uh, to the forefront in particular over the last couple of years. So I'm just kind of curious the process by which you sort of tried to parse it out and understand these different dimensions. Yeah. Um, so so if, if we worked on something together, Alex, I could show you there, there's probably 500 indicators that kind of roll up into these categories. And it's, you know, so the 500 words that you would find that would roll up into these categories that helps you weight, you know, where the source of the trust disconnect might be from. And so I think that that is powerful as well. So you understand these categories of these dimensions, and then you can dig down to the next level to understand what what the underlying source is based on um, a sorting and weighting of various words. And, and you mentioned before that, um, that that you've got evidence now um, using so sort of the NLP um, methodology um, of, of, of getting the, the trust index. So you've been able to show that the more trusted companies can generate more uh, financial value. But you also looked at in, in the study at other um, questions such as um, looking across regions or looking at, at the uh, at how stable. Uh, trust scores are and, and other ways in which it correlates, for instance, um, ESG ratings. So uh, any, anything else you want to sort of add in terms of findings that you uh, that might have been surprising versus those maybe more predictable? That, it's an interesting question. Um, I think the most surprising thing, Alex, in terms of the work, um, let me tell you what it wasn't. It's not that different industries have different level of trust. That's, you know, we had to prove that with the data, but it wasn't necessarily true. And it, it, it you know, it was it was going to be true, right? Certain industries would have would have higher trust. What was not particularly surprising was that within an industry or within a sector, there are differences. I mean, that that's interesting to the individual player, but it's not it's not interesting overall. What is interesting is that you could look at a company. Um, that gets in trouble, you know, in, in terms of perception of trust and media coverage today. And you can see two, three years back, the erosion of trust. And so, so what was interesting to me is, is that that erosion of trust is actually a predictor of future problems that will arise versus, you know, versus something that's confirmatory. So actually as a company or as a CEO monitoring your trust index, I think is meaningful because I think it, it helps to, you know, it, it's a, it helps to keep you like in the guardrails and understand what's being said by your employees, by your suppliers, by your customers and getting that feedback in a, in a quantitative way that allows you to act, I think is super valuable. Absolutely. Well, the, um, the pandemic was certainly um, an event that, that helped us really understand, I guess, a little bit about trust and culture and other things in organizations and, and sort of um, how, how stable or, or resilient they, they were in the face of the pandemic. I'm curious, um, given in particular your, your leadership roles um, at BCG, uh, what, what impact the pandemic um, had in terms, in terms of uh, BCG, in terms of the uh, consulting industry, and, and how did you all adapt to it? Um, in the short term and maybe the the long term effects. There's a lot in that question. Yeah, um, I, I remember that that January and February. I was on. I was not the head of North America. I was, but I was on our global executive committee as the head of marketing and um, and what we call the client team, which is global sales. And I remember being on a lot of the executive committee calls, and we were talking about what we were seeing in China, and then what we were seeing, you know, in in, in other places as COVID spread. And I remember being in a very crowded team room. I was in Baltimore with a big team with shared food all around the place. And we were four days a week on site, one day a week off site. And, um, and I remember the next day we were working from home. Okay, I tell that story because it was so abrupt. Um, and you know, we went from four days a week to working at home. And there were a lot of externalities with COVID, you know, that that we're working our way out of, which is we onboarded a lot of people during COVID that never got to meet each other and didn't get to affiliate and didn't get to come into the office. Now we're we've put a lot of energy into effort into integrating people and having affiliation events and bringing them back, and I think that's paying off. So there was a lot that happened during COVID, which was a strain on our business and a strain on our people. You know, imagine the, you know the 
person working from home with two or three children and, and trying to work that out without a caregiver. But I think the good news is looking on the positive side, um, we learn to work in a different way. And I don't, we will never, you know, go back to that team room with everyone there. I mean, we, we are much more hybrid, you know, so we, we value our together time. Um, we value our client time, but we also know we can be super productive in this environment. You know, we don't have to be on the road all the time. We don't have to be, you know, we can have a little bit more flexibility. And not only do we understand it, but our clients understand it. And they're, you know, helping to reinforce the good behavior with us. And so while there are many negatives coming out of COVID, many, you know, I think one of the positives is it, it has changed the way we work. And I think will be a positive way you know, for the for the sustainability of people going forward. And Alex, if I may, sustainability of our planet, because mm -hmm. flying less, commuting less, all of these things will, will be good for our climate and the planet too. Great, I'd, I'd love to talk, uh, to dig into that a little bit more as well. But while we're on sort of the topic of, of change um, and organizational change, which I know you've, you've worked on a lot with, with many, many organizations, um, what what pieces of advice would you give to leaders who are faced with organizational uh, change? Um, uh, yeah, I'll leave it open like that. Sure. Well, we undergo a lot of change at PCG because we've changed our model, you know, over time. And and I have to say, with with at either at PCG or with with every client I've served, you know, change is hard. I mean, it's it's first of all, it's hard. And 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 I think as leaders. You know that, but it is it is always hard, and um, it's harder. It's hard, you know. In when when the company's in a tough situation, it's even harder when they're not, because when they're doing a lot of things that are going really well, and it's gone really well in in the past, actually the need for change is is less intuitive. So I'll I'll talk about three things: head, heart, and hands. Um, with heart being at the center, because I think that's the most important. But I think let me start with head, which is you have to, for many people, not all people, but for many people, you have to have the data that supports that you need to change. So whether it's an externality and what's happening in the environment or a competitor move or labor, labor shortage or whatever it is, or the, the, com, com, you know, the confluence of all those things, there's a part which is around head, which is, so why do we have to change? Why do we have to change? And you have to create that case for change that, that appeals to the head. Then I'll go to hands, which is, and, and of course, what do you need to do? You need to monitor that change. You need to say, this is how we're going to change. This is why we're going to change. This is what it means. This is what it means in a very detailed way. These are the metrics of, of success. This is how we're going to measure it. And being really um, disciplined in terms of measuring the change, measuring the success, um, measuring the failures and accounting, you know, accounting for the stuff because it's in, in, in every change effort, stuff goes wrong. And the important thing is to measure it and to learn from it and to know that you're going to come back and, and fix the things that have gone wrong. So that's the hands piece, which is the hard work. And then there's the heart, which is, um, you know, for, you know, for your, probably your employees most of all, but for all of your stakeholders, why are we doing this? Why should I care? Like, why do I want to do this? I, un I might understand in my head that we have to do this, but what makes me want to do this? What's in it for me? What's in it for my colleague? What's in it for my family? And actually appealing to the heart and, and, and motivating and appealing to people's passion um, is critical um, for unlocking the change. And so all of those three things are key. And for different people, it's in different parts. But, um, but if I had to choose one, and you can't choose one, but if I had to choose one, it would be the heart. Yeah, well, that, that's a very nice way to break it down. And I'm, I'm curious, given that we were talking about trust before, and, and you mentioned culture, um, where, where do those most closely align? Is it more in the head or is it more in the heart? In terms of culture? Uh, in terms of culture or in terms of trust and, and, and allowing for that, that change to, to proceed as well as possible. Yeah, I think... Um, I think whether you're changing trust or changing culture, um, they have to see that you're changing stuff, that the leaders really care and they're, and they're changing stuff, but then they also have to believe that they care. So it's sort of like, it's like if you say you care and you don't change anything, 
then it doesn't, but if, but if, if you just change stuff and it's not clear why you're changing it and that you care and that it's leading to a, you know, a emotional benefit, then that's not great either. So I think, I think Alex, you have to do, you have to do both. But if you lose people in terms of the emotional piece, people might go along with the change, but then they might leave for a better opportunity. They might just not be took. So you need to capture the heart. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Well, um, I want to talk about a, a particular type of change that we're all trying to affect in our organizations around um, DEI. Um, but I just, before I, I, I ask the next question, I just wanted to remind our audience uh, to please feel free to put in questions as well in the, in the Q&A uh, function, and we will, we will pick up those questions. So um, let's talk a little bit about um, DI or DIB, as we call it here at, at Cary, belonging. Um, I'm just curious, uh, first of all, what role you see large companies like BCG with so many um, employees around the world um, what role you see them playing in advancing um, ideals for DEI uh, within the organization and society as a whole? Yeah, I think I think corporations can play a really valuable role. And you know, selfishly, Alex, I mean, look at all the data. I mean, what the data says, including BCG's studies, it says that diverse teams perform better, not the same. That diverse teams perform better because they challenge the status quo because it's not. It's not groupthink. It's it, it's actually by bringing together people from diverse backgrounds, diverse perspectives, you actually get better results. And at BCG, we need to get better results all the time with our clients. That's why we're asked to. So from a business perspective, the rationale is totally clear. And I think um, you know this just resonates for me so so strongly in terms of my journey at BCG and the teams that that I've worked with. And look, we have a bunch of purpose principles that are really um, key to how we operate. Um, but for me, it's it, it's the purpose principle that resonates the most is unlocking the potential of those who advance the world. And it has to be, it can't be a narrow segment of society. It has to be a broad segment of society. Um, I'm super proud of what, what BCG has done on DEI. I mean, even years and years ago in 1997, we set up the Pride Network. You know, in early 2000, we had women at BCG. Um, you know, we, we tackled challenges around talent pools and recruiting. Um, I'm talking 20 years ago now, but that's the easiest talent. That's the easiest challenge. You can recruit, but if you don't retain and you don't promote, then it's insufficient. Um, and so, you know, if you look at when I was, Alex at BCG, I was a new MDP. I think there were five uh, women MDPs in North America. Today, today there's 132, you know, so that is, progress. It's been a lot of years that I've been a partner, but it's it's still pretty significant um, progress. And we have eight different um, uh, diversity affiliation networks. And they're really um, the people who participate in those networks and a large percentage of our people do are really passionate about them. And it gives them source of strength in terms of affiliation, but it also is a great source of strength in terms of career advice and navigation. And you know, maybe just one other thing um, I would say is my predecessor before me and 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 on my journey so far, um, you know, I've been really keen to find um, a diverse set of next generation leaders as well. Um, because again, you can recruit, find, you can retain. We measure that by the way, every month, our retention overall and our retention by cohort and our retention by cohort by by um, diversity indicator. Um, but then you have to also create the future, future leaders which are diverse. And so that has been a journey we've been on too. And it's not hard to do because so many of our, so many of our people from diverse backgrounds are so talented and so good that there's big pools of people that are, you know, you can potentially promote, but, but you have to be cognizant of all of that. And so we're on our journey, we're not perfect. You know, there's still, opportunity, but I am proud of the progress we've made. That's wonderful. And that's certainly where business schools such as um, ours um, really need to partner closely together um, because that is a joint uh, journey. Um, I, you know, you mentioned women at BCG and um, I know you've been involved in diversity issues um, throughout your career, uh, particularly in, in terms of advancing opportunities uh, for women. And you're now involved uh, with some interesting research about the care economy 
And so I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit more about um, how you define the care economy, where you see uh, the growth and the opp opportunities and uh, how it's evolving over time. Yeah. So, um, you know, we have talked over many years about um, maternity leave and then, you know, parental leave, all, you know, very, very good things. And then um, family leave. You know, so so when when you look at, at, at our workforce today and the war for talent and the fact that um, yeah, the fact that you know, how do you make how do you make um, the workforce in North America as productive as it can be and as satisfied as it can be? And if if you look at at most of the people in the workforce, there's going to be some point in time over their careers where where they, they just need to get meaningful time off. It might be, might be around having a child. It, it might be due to illness. It might be due to illness of a family member, taking care of a parent, et cetera. And so, so for me and for BCG, it's an acknowledgement of, you know, we need to have, we can't define it around an event, just a specific event. Yes, those things are important, but we also need to have this um, this notion of the care economy and how we support our people. And um, you know, I, we've been working on this with one of our um, greatest, most passionate, most intelligent uh, alumna, Indra Nui, um, and then a colleague of mine who's who's led the research, um, Emily Coase. And we realize as we look at all the data, the situation in the U.S. is is only going to become more challenging when you look at the eligible workforce. Um, just a, a quick plug: if if you've had a chance to read or, or listen to Indra's book, it's a short read. It's a short listen. It's an incredible um, uh, documentation of her inspiring journey to CEO of, of Pepsi and beyond. But it also talks about the importance of care and the care economy and um, and how that influenced her and her. Her whole her whole rise to the top and how she couldn't have gotten there, but I think, you know, we have historic job vacancies. Um, we have five million more open jobs in some fields, and we have people in the workforce. Um, this is going to be a challenge, which is going to continue. Um, and you know, I think I think we need to lean into it. And you know, I know some places in the federal government are trying to do that, but I think as as corporations, as companies, as places where people spend their time, um, I think it's some place that we have to be not only supportive of, but invest in. Yeah, I, I think it's it's such an important point. And, and um, I, I think for many years, it was something that was was sort of hidden um, as, as um, you know, something that people didn't want to talk about. And now it, it's wonderful to see people being much more open and talking about their challenges. And and the help and flexibility that they need. So, um, so that's that's fantastic that you're working on that. Um, we do uh, we do have uh, some questions starting to come in. Um, so these these may be from uh, different angles here. So we'll go back and forth. Um, but let me start with a, a question going back to the um, to the trust index. Um, uh, the question is very interesting that that you mentioned about the two to three year period that erosion. Uh, period of distrust. Do you have any data on how long it takes uh, for the trust of a company to to rebuild or to bounce back? Yeah, you can you can improve things in a, a six. I mean, you can you can take meaningful actions to improve things in a six month period, particularly with your employees. And of course, that depends a little bit on your turnover rate too. But if you think about a retailer with pretty high, typically pretty high levels of turnover, you can make major improvements with your employees in, in only six months. And so while there, there's always going to be stuff reticent, you know, in terms of an article that was published three years ago, or obviously a scandal, you know, that there's a lot that you can do. Um, also with your investors, you know, if, if there's a lack of trust with your investors because of a not fully transparent, you know, process for disclosing stuff. And then you set a, a, a record of being really transparent for a few quarters, you can really change the needle on that. Um, so I think the good news is, you know, it because you may have a trust gap, you know, it doesn't have to persist. There are actions that you can take to meaning, meaningfully raise um, that in a, in a short period of time. 
first thing is to recognize the problem before you can fix it. And obviously that's where the index is um, extremely useful. Um, I'll also uh, give a shameless plug for the report is on, on your website. I, I yes. downloaded it a little while ago, so I encourage others to do that as well. I think it's, it's really um, excellent. Um, question about, um, about keeping uh, sharp. Um, what do you do to keep your skills sharp and stay competitive? Personally? Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, I, I'm always challenged by, Pete. you know, this is not an environment where people are shy. So, you know, so I'm always challenged by my colleagues, um, you know, frankly, you, you know, to, to, to do better, to be better, and, and in a really positive way. And so, um, you know, if that's thinking about, you know, our strategy in the future and, you know, market share gains, or, you know, there's, all, there's always some challenge in the organization in terms of doing better. I mean, I, frankly, that keeps me sharp. I, I think serving clients keeps me sharp and continuing to spend time with clients. You know, sometimes that's in the capacity that it used to be in when I spend all my time with clients, but but often it's 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 just interacting with clients, getting feedback on our teams, and um, and then you know what else do I do? I do try to. We have an amazing um, assortment of um, really deep. We call them lab, but they're training modules, and they're interactive training modules. And I do try to keep myself current on things like that. So whether that's on climate or on AI or on other topics, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll attend one of those lab trainings, you know, just to make sure that, that the stuff that we're doing in the business that I understand, you know, at a grassroots level, at least at a basic grassroots level, you know, what it is that, that we're driving. That's great. Well, sort of in, in line with that, there's another question um, uh, that I would summarize by saying sort of, how do you support transitioning um, consultants working in one area, one sector to another. So I'll read the full question uh, just to make sure I'm not missing the, um, the, the, uh, the depth of it. Um, how considerable are the barriers to flexibility between subject matter themes or broad sector buckets within consulting? Uh, for instance, entering into the consumer goods space and transitioning to federal government, does the organization, in your experience with BCG, facilitate this transition or flexibility, or is this more circumstantial? Are you the norm or the exception? So maybe if you could talk a little bit about sort of uh, the change that you, um, that you mentioned is one of the exciting things about working um, in consulting. How easy is it to, to transfer over uh, between different sectors? It's honestly, it's relatively easy to do. Now that doesn't mean that everyone chooses to do it because some people think what's really interesting is R&D in healthcare. And so they really want to focus on that for, you know, a lot of, a lot of their career and that's okay. Like if that's what you want to do. Um, but it's quite easy in BCG. You know, first of all, in terms of when you come in, you come in in a role where you have a lot of opportunity to try different things and you, and you have that for many years. Even when you get more senior, there's a lot of adjacency. So something that might be, you know, I was a consumer products person, but I did a lot of work in, in healthcare marketing and sales. Not that I was our worldwide expert in marketing sales, but there are a lot of adjacencies in, in terms of branding and marketing between consumer and healthcare. Um, so, so this notion of adjacencies. Now I happen to change, you know, from leading consumer to leading federal government. And that was both a pull and a push. So I was interested in doing it. You know, I had lived in Washington most of my adult life. I had always, in my mind, thought about working in the federal government. So it was it was a personal passion, something I was interested in doing. But it was also a need, you know, that BCG had. So I was asked by the CEO to do it. So in that case, it was a push and pull. But you would be surprised at how relatively easy it is to go across things um, for a lot of your career. Great. Um, th there's a, a question here sort of also about um, career uh, progression a little bit within consulting uh, with a different um, angle to it. So um, would you, it, the question is, would you consider the competitiveness between coworkers to get that next promotion a reality or misconception in consulting? And how does this affect teamwork? You talked a lot about teamwork uh, before in business schools. And, and obviously we know that 
uh, folks that, that go to a company like to a firm like BCG are, are highly successful and highly driven. And so how do you find that sort of um, uh, ambition and teamwork sort of uh, work together? I think it's a misconception, but let me explain. So if you look at BCG and we've grown at 14% per year, on average, right? But CAGR, CAGR of 14% per year since I joined in 1993, that means we've had a basic doubling of the firm every five years. When the firm grows, now that's not a startup, that's not 100% per year, but it's, it's a really healthy growth rate. What does that mean? It means more opportunity. So it means that BCG, when I joined BCG, there was no Washington office. Okay, so we opened a Washington office, it's, I don't know, 500 people now, but so someone has to become the head of the Washington office because we've opened a Washington office. This year, we've opened an office in Nashville, we've opened an office in Raleigh, Durham, and at the end of last year, we, we opened an office in San Diego. Those are all new leadership positions. We didn't have a climate practice, you know, you know, a short time ago. Now we have a climate practice. So it's interesting as BCG has expanded its capabilities and expanded its geographies. It's also expanded our opportunity for leadership. So let me click down. It, it also means you know, our case team. I mean, we operate at a leverage ratio, which, which is low. What does that mean for every MDP or equity partner? we don't have that many, you know, we have, you know, roughly an eight leverage ratio. So, so that means um, that the criticality of that pyramid and our, our desire to retain the people in that period is so important. We don't have, you know, a thousand people or a hundred people per equity MDP where it's like, well, if people don't make it, so be it. I mean, we really have to care for our period because it, it pyramid, because, because of um, because of the way we operate, and so I think at a company like BCG, there's a ton of opportunity, and it's not cutthroat, and it's not win lose, and you know I think it's really fun when you rise with your peers, and that's the the culture that we try to foster. Yeah, no, that's wonderful to hear. That's um, um, a question going back to trust again. Um, is there you talked before about um, you know trust with your employees, with your customers, with your investors, as you said, as well, just most recently, and, and yeah. obviously with the community. Um, is there, um, did, the, did the research find that there is a group of stakeholders where you find that building trust is particularly valuable? So I, I don't know if you've got any sort of a ranking or anything like yeah. that, but that's what the question is getting at. Well, I think what I, what I would say is, um... If you look at your net promoter scores and the, the the folks that recommend you and really love you and lean into loving you, that's a very important group because whether or not they're liking things on Facebook or whether they're posting things, that's all input. You know, obviously there's there's millions of data points of input, but that's all input into the trust index. And so having those passionate supporters, your net promoters. Um, that is critical. And when your net promoters um, turn on you and they start being very vocal um, and, and disliking and posting and whatever, that, that is when it's at risk. So I think in terms of the key, key group, it's going to vary by, by company and by entity, but it's those that are passionate about the category, passion and vocal. So your net promoters or your net detractors in, in the other scenario. So uh, to, to pursue an, another angle on, on the trust as well, you, I think one of the findings of the report is that um, those that, that score high on the, on the trust index also tend to be um, genuine, genuinely serious about ESG. Yes. And there's a lot of skepticism around um, ESG and you know, whitewashing, greenwashing, whatever you want to call it. Yes. Um, so I'm curious, um, any, any particular findings there, but more generally, you talked about the climate practice. And so maybe you could just give us a broad overview of where you see the opportunities uh, in supporting companies and organizations and the kind of consulting work that you're doing in that area. Yeah. Um, I think, I, I think those that are really serious about ESG do rise to the top, <clears throat> but I'm gonna use the word authentic. 
So those that are authentic and it shows up in, in everything that, that they're doing um, is, is those who get credit for it. Um, and I think there is skepticism and, and potential backlash if you embrace ESG, embrace it, but you actually don't walk the walk. And so we're really working with our clients. We're very careful, by the way, of the climate work we take on because you know we work with a range of companies, but, but the one criteria is that they have to be really serious about the intentionality of not just doing a study or an effort or about branding or about communications. It really needs to be about the core of the operation and what are they trying to change? Are they trying to reduce food spoilage? Are they trying to you know, simplify their, their supply chain to take out, take out carbon emission and cost. So there is a fair amount of skepticism around ESG. Um, and there is some greenwashing that is happening. You know, I think as, as we define ESG a little bit better, and you know, the indices have, have, have undergone some criticism, but as we define it a little bit better, um, you know, I think it will be helpful in terms of tracking against it. And I think there are those companies that really are not only saying all the right things, but doing the right things, and they're getting credit for it. The, the other area of, of passion that you mentioned before is, is AI. And, and obviously the, the trust index is a great example of how you all have, are using this for, for your work. Um, are there other ways in which like an ESG index would be, um, given that we're talking about that, would, is, is something that you all uh, work with in terms of sort of understanding um, uh, whether or not the companies are really moving forward in their ESG and doing that through um, NLP or other AI techniques, or maybe just generally, if you could talk a little bit about how you see AI affecting your your practice, uh, your various practices at this point in time. Yeah, I think I think AI has allowed us to do a lot of things at scale that were more, I'll say, manual before, and and has allowed us to do. Um, some deeper insight and in, in, in analytics. Um, you know, it might be around consumer behavior, for example. So why don't I why don't I just stay on that example? Which is AI can be a very powerful tool, right? And and you've seen it in action, I'm sure yourself, in terms of consumer behavior. And then we come to responsible AI. And and, and we are definitely out there in terms of responsible AI because you know AI in terms of consumer behavior can be a fine tool, but if, if you're using it to actually drive behavior that's not for societal benefit, whatever that may look like, then it's not the type of work we need to be working on. So we are using AI you know, across, whether it's a, a, a looking at value drivers in a business, whether it's looking at um, opportunities in terms of consumer insight, we're, we're using AI across the board. Um, but we are very careful to be quite responsible in, in our use of AI. And we undergo when we take on new projects, um, we, have, we have a vetting committee that looks at, okay, so what is the remit of this project? What are you trying to do? And this is true for climate as well. You know, we really think about the work that we take on and some areas are very, very clear, the black and white, go, no go. But in some of these newer areas like climate and like AI, there's more discussion and vetting around, around the nature of the client, the nature of the assignment and whether it makes sense for us to do it or not. Yeah. Well, we, we um, in redesigning our program, our full-time MBA program a couple of years ago, we added a, um, a core course in AI just um, because of the importance in so many different areas and having a basic knowledge of, um, of, of the benefits, but also things that we have to be very careful about. Um, I'm, I'm curious whether or not there are any other courses that, that you didn't have when you were going through business school that, that these days you think um, we, that, that our students should have in terms of um, you know, data literacy or, or digital literacy or anything else? No, I think it's great that you guys have added that. I don't, I don't know, Alex, do you have a course on climate? Uh, we, do, we do not. And that's certainly an area that we're thinking very, very carefully about. Yeah. I mean, that might be one I'd, I'd consider as well. Um, I'm, I'm sure I, I'm, I'm sure if I looked at, at your course book, it, it's probably more vibrant than, than mine at the time. Um, but, uh, you know, one of the things which is true, sharing a personal story, which is I was um, in business school, you know, I love the analytical stuff and I love the modeling and I love the finance course and the marketing course. And I, I, I probably didn't lean into as much some of the organizational development work. Now, leadership, I, I, I liked, but... Or, 
and that is so important. I mean, that you know that if you talk about working and, and understanding people and changing a company, and whether you're working in a startup or you're working in a big company or you're working in a medical center or you're working at BCG, I mean, the oh, the organizational development, organizational behavior stuff is is just so important to unlocking a healthy culture and um, and growth and 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 joy, frankly, in a company. Yeah, I, I think that's that's a great insight, and um, I think even more important these days um, than, than it has been in particular with all the changes to the way that people are working and uh, collaborating and so on. So, well, Sharon, I want to, um, we've pretty much come to the, the end of our hour here, and I just wanted to thank you so much for taking the time to, to share all these insights with us. Um, I think I speak for all of us, and we've gained a lot more knowledge about um, the changes in the consulting industry and some of the really exciting things that you're working on right now. So thank you um, so much for, for being with us. Thank you, Alex. And thank you to your team too. You've been great to work with. Absolutely. Thanks so much, Sharon. And I just wanted to um, thank our audience for participating in the discussion. And um, we hope also that you're able to join us um, for our next Distinguished Speaker event, which will be on October 27th. And we'll be welcoming Ralph Semmel, who is the, the leader, the director of the Johns Hopkins Applied uh, Physics Lab. So thanks again, everybody, for joining us. And we'll see you again at the next event.